Hi, I'm Susie Rhodes with Pass Masters. Welcome to our questions of the week. This week, our topic will be characteristics of fixed income securities. You can expect this topic to appear on the SIE exam, Series 6, Series 7, Series 65, and Series 66. I will be covering questions from our Past Masters Securities courses. Let's take a look at our learning management system. In our Past Masters courses, I have broken down the content outline into manageable topics. Each topic will have a topic quiz. Let's check out some questions about characteristics of fixed income securities. Interest on a new bond starts to accrue as of the, just like the real test, you have four choices. They're multiple choice exams. We have issue date, X dividend date, dated date, and record date. The correct answer for interest, when does it begin to accrue? That would be the dated date. In each of our questions within our learning management system, you can click show explanation and there's also an audio explanation for each of your questions. Interest on a new bond starts. Regarding income taxes owed, which of the following statements is true? Always read all four choices before picking the right answer. Interest paid on municipal securities is tax-free at the federal level. That's true, but <laughs> let's check all four choices. Interest paid on tips is tax-free at the federal level. That is false. U.S. government securities interest is taxable federally, but tax-free at the state level. A TIPS is a type of U.S. government security. Interest paid on U.S. government securities is tax-free federally. That is false. Interest paid on municipal securities is tax-free at the state level. That is also false. So we're looking for the true statement here. We only have one true statement. I want to help you with something that many students get easily confused on, and that is the taxability of interest on bonds. So a corporate bond, the interest is fully taxable at the state and federal level always. But we do have a special rule when we are talking about U.S. government securities versus municipal securities. So let me teach you a little trick here. We are talking about the interest income on U.S. government securities versus municipal securities. And there is a saying that will help you remember. It goes like this. They tax themselves, but not each other, but not each other. They tax themselves, but not each other. This is the rule for the test. So what does that mean? So when you do your taxes, April 15th, you have taxes that are owed at the federal level and you have taxes that are owed at the state level. So when you purchase a U.S. government security, U.S. government debt, they tax themselves. The interest is taxable on your federal income tax return, but it is tax free at the state level. They tax themselves, but not each other. When we're talking about municipal debt, municipal debt is issued by a state or lower taxing authority. We still have the two places where taxes are owed, federal and at the state level. The interest income for municipal bond is tax free at the federal level, taxable on your state income tax return. You're going to make the assumption that the municipal bond is from another state. The test doesn't tell you that. I am telling you that after years of experience, that is what you want to assume. 
if the test question wants it to be a double exempt bond, it's going to say in the question that the investor who lives in Arizona buys an Arizona municipal bond. Where is the interest taxable? Well, then nowhere. It's a double exempt bond. Or they could say, where is the interest tax free? And then you would say both federally and at the state level. Be sure to read the question carefully. You are, however, going to assume that the bond is from another state. So it is federally income tax free municipal debt interest income, but taxable on your state income tax return. What about a capital gain? Capital gains are always taxable both at the state and federal level. Do not let the test trick you. The bond is trading in the secondary market for more than par value. Which of the following statements is true? Before we even look at the choices, let me give you a teeter totter. This will help you with these bond questions. So the bond is trading in the secondary market for more than par value. So I want you to take with you in your mind <laughs> into the test, the following bond teeter totter. So we have the Bond family. They just moved into my neighborhood. They are from New York. So the nominal yield on a bond, the family has three kids. They were all born in New York. Is that ever going to change? No. So the nominal yield on a bond, think of it like a tattoo on my chest. It is never going to change. On one side of the teeter-totter, neighborhood park, we have a teeter-totter. We have Price, that's the oldest boy, and his brothers who are twins are called yield and rate. Yield and rate. So rate stands for interest rates. Interest rates drive the bond teeter-totter. So what did this question say? It said that the bond was trading at a premium. So if the price has gone up to be trading at more than par value, we would have yield, and rate. Yield and rate always go together. Interest rates drive the teeter-totter. So interest rates have gone down, causing the price of this bond in the secondary market to be more than par value. So use the teeter-totter right on your scratch paper. There's something about writing it down that just helps your brain kind of work better. So please, please use that for your test. So let's go back and look at this question. So we're looking for which statement is true. Interest rates have remained stable? No. The bond's yield to maturity will be less than its current yield. The bond's nominal yield will now be more than when it was issued. Nominal yield, like a tattoo on your chest, never going to change. Kids were born in New York, never changes. Nominal yield never changes. Interest rates have gone up. Well, the bond is trading for more than par value. So what did we say about interest rates? interest rates have gone down. So the only statement that is true, remember interest rates and yields, we have current yield, yield to maturity and yield to call. Those are the three yields. So if interest rates have gone down, current yield has also gone down. Yield to maturity has gone down even more and yield to call would be the lowest, sometimes called yield to worst. So the bond's yield to maturity will be less than its current yield. That is the only true statement. When interest rates in the economy are stable, which yield is best to evaluate a bond in the secondary market? Interest rates in the economy are stable. So we have four yields, current yield, nominal yield, yield to maturity, and yield to call. If interest rates are stable, the best yield would be yield to maturity. So let's revisit this bond teeter-totter. Let's expand a little bit here. So we have the yields are current yield, yield to maturity, and yield to call. When a bond is trading at more than par value, so interest rates have gone down, the market price is at a premium, then the most important yield to consider would be yield to call, also called yield to worst. Issuers call bonds when interest rates have decreased enough that it makes sense to refinance the debt. 
But if interest rates are stable, interest rates are stable. It is the bond's yield to maturity. So let's look at what if the bond is trading at a discount. If the bond is trading at a discount, we'd have current yield, yield to maturity, yield to call, because they never get up and move around. They always stay in the same order. So yield to maturity is going to be reflective of what you paid for the bond versus what it's worth at maturity. So if interest rates have not gone down, it makes the most sense to consider the yield to maturity on a bond when purchasing a bond. If in fact interest rates have gone up, it's still going to be yield to maturity that you would consider in purchasing that bond. Because think about it, how likely is an issuer to call a bond? If interest rates have gone up, they're not gonna call a bond if interest rates have gone up. So if interest rates are stable or if interest rates have increased, yield to maturity would be the best yield to consider when purchasing a bond. A bond is trading at 101, which of the following is true? 101? What is that? Those are points. A point on a bond is worth $10. So there's different ways you can do it. You can think of it as 101% of par. Par on a corporate bond is $1,000. You can add a zero. You can multiply the points times 10. So this bond is trading at a premium, which means interest rates have gone down. The only reason why a bond in the secondary market would be trading for more than par value is because interest rates have decreased relative to the nominal yield on the bond. The nominal yield is reflective of interest rates at the time the bond was originally issued. So let's check our choices. Current rates are less than at issue. So yeah, but let's check all four choices. This bond would have a current yield that is higher than its nominal yield. False. Remember, interest rates and yields go together. So if interest rates have gone down, yields have gone down too. The bond is trading at a discount? No, it's trading at 101 points. So 101 points times 10, $1,010. It's actually trading at a premium. Current rates are more than at issue. So if current interest rates have gone up, the price of this bond would be trading at a discount in the secondary market. The true statement here is current rates, those are current interest rates, are less than at issue. An investor has purchased a foreign bond with a 6% nominal yield. Which of the following statements is not true? So we're looking for a false statement. So when a bond has a 6% nominal yield, I'm gonna ask, what does that mean to you? So 6% of par is the annual interest on this bond. 6% of par value, which is $1,000, is $60. Bonds pay interest semi-annually, so every six months, $30 in interest income would be paid. Let's check for the false statement. The investor purchased this bond for investment income. Well, yeah, that's why people buy bonds, for investment income. The interest payment will be subject to currency exchange rate risk. Well, it's a foreign bond, so yes, that is also true. The 6% nominal yield will change over time. Well, that's false. So. The nominal yield, tattoo on my chest, never gonna change, gonna be there forever. Might get a little bit different looking over time, but not going to change. So that is a false statement. Let's check the last choice. The principal repayment will be subject to currency exchange rate risk. That is true. So the right answer for this question is the false statement. I cannot tell you how easy that is to trip up on on the test. So please be very careful. What I would do with a true false question like this is I would write one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D, and I would go through, because a lot of times students are going to be like, hey, but the first choice was true. Why isn't that the right answer? Well, because there's many true statements in those four choices, which is a clue that you're not looking for a true statement. You're looking for a false statement. So the false statement is the right answer. The 6% nominal yield will change over time. Correct answer, because it's false.
Don't let the test get you with that. When are callable bonds first callable? Choices include at the earliest date specified in the bond's indenture. I like that. At any time at the discretion of the issuer. No. After they've been outstanding for at least seven years. No. Any time interest rates go down by at least 1%. Well, certainly, issuers like to call bonds when interest rates have gone down. The correct statement, bonds are first callable at the earliest date that is specified in the bond's indenture. So if interest rates have gone down, you would want to know when can this bond be called. You would want to consider its yield to call when purchasing this bond, also called the bond's yield to worst. In order for the interest paid by a municipal bond to be tax-free at the state level, which of the following must be true? So we talked about this. On a municipal bond, interest income is tax-free federally. So municipal bonds are always sold to investors in high tax brackets. Interest income on a municipal bond is taxable at the state level unless the bond is issued in the same state that the investor lives in. So let's check our choices here. The bond must be held for 10 years, false. The bond must be from a state neighboring the investor's home state, false. The bond must be from the investor's home state, that is true, but check all of your choices. The bond must be from another state. So if you think about it from the point of view of the state, the state wants wealthy individuals to keep their money in the state. So they give them this tax break, making the interest income double exempt if they buy a municipal bond from the same state that the investor lives in. A convertible bond can be converted into choices include shares of common stock, a mortgage bond, a debenture, which is an unsecured corporate bond, or shares of preferred stock. A convertible bond is convertible into shares of the issuer's common stock. The price of a convertible bond is most reflective of Choices include the current market price of the underlying common stock, the time left until maturity, its nominal yield, or current interest rates versus the nominal yield. Remember, a convertible bond can be converted into shares of common stock of the issuer. So whatever you can convert into, however many shares you can get for your one bond times the current market price of common stock, that is generally what the price of the convertible bond is going to be most reflective of. Let me give you an example here of a convertible bond. Let's say that the convertible bond has a 10 to 1 conversion ratio. So for your one bond, you can get 10 shares of the issuer's common stock. And let's say that the current market price of common stock is $90 a share. So if this convertible bond was trading at a market price of, let's say, par value, just to give us an example, par value on a bond is $1,000, would you want to give up your one worth 1,000 to get 10 times 90 shares worth 900? Would you want to convert? No. So that would be what we call below parity. Keep your convertible bond. However, what if common stock was trading not for 90, but for $120 a share? Let's say, although this is not really what would happen, but let's just pretend that the convertible bond is trading for par value. What's underneath it now, 120 times 10, is worth $1,200. Would you want to get up, give up your one to get your 10 shares? Absolutely. That's called above parity. Convert. 
However, in reality, this convertible bond is going to trade at a market price that is reflective of the common stock that's underlying it. So it's going to trade at a market price of around $1,200. That's it for this week's questions of the week, characteristics of fixed income securities. If you have any questions about this topic, just ask me in the comments below. If you would like to explore our course offerings or to enroll in one of our securities courses, just click on the link that is found in the description below this video. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and turn the notifications on. I look forward to having you as a student soon. Happy studies. You got this.